A common method of proof is through mathematical induction. And proof by induction proves that a statement of the form P of N is true for all natural numbers N. So what we do to prove this is we need to show two things. We need to establish that the truth of P of N implies the truth of P of N plus one. So we show that if it's true for the nth case, it is definitely true for the n plus oneth case. And then that all I have to do then is establish some first case. So usually p0 or p1, or that once I've established it's true for some starting point, and pn implies pn plus 1. If I've proven the first case and that implies the second, the second implies the third, the third implies the fourth, but once I've shown it's true for some starting point, I've shown it's true for all positive integers. So you could think of this a bit like setting up sort of cascading dominoes. I have to get it such that each domino will knock down the one after it, that Pn will establish the truth of Pn plus 1, and then I have to establish that I can knock over the first domino. So we're going to consider the partial sum of the geometric series. So a geometric series is one where I'm adding consecutive terms such that each term is a common ratio multiplied by the previous term. So I'm adding a plus a times the ratio r plus a times the ratio r squared plus a r cubed, plus a r to the fourth, plus dot, 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 plus a r to the n. So I'm adding up to the nth power. And I'm going to work this out for the ratio not being one. I'll just remove that case. We'd have that one separately. So by induction, I want to show that the sum up to the nth power s n is a multiplied by 1 minus r to the n plus 1 divided by 1 minus r. So remember, I have to do two stages for my proof by induction. The first stage is to show that it's true for some first case, so I'll do the zeroth power here, and that's trivial. If I set n is 0, then I get a plus nothing else, so s of zero should be equal to a, and sure enough, setting n equals zero in what I'm claiming to be true, I get one minus r to the zero plus one, divided by one minus r. So I get one minus r divided by one minus r multiplied by a, which is a. So it's definitely true for n equals zero. Now I just assume that it's true for some natural number n, and I want to show that that means it's true for n plus 1. Now increasing n to n plus 1 is just adding one more term to the partial sum. So if I assume the partial sum is true for n, then I add on the n plus 1th power. So I add on a r to the n plus 1. And I want to show that that statement, sn plus a r to the n plus 1, will give me what I'm trying to prove, i.e the statement for s n plus 1. To complete this proof by induction, I need to show that if I add the n plus 1th power, i.e. I add a r to the n plus 1, to the statement for the sum up to the nth power, I will get something of the form of what I claimed the statement for the partial sum would be up to the n plus one power. So I can write out what I'm claiming Sn is, plus what I'm adding on for one more term. So I can add on a r to the n plus one. Well, I've got a common multiple of a, so I can just uh, take that out, take the factor of a out. 
So now I've got two things which I'm trying to add within the bracket. So let's put them both over the common denominator of 1 minus r. So I need to multiply the back term of r to the n plus 1 by, by 1 minus r divided by 1 minus r. And when I do that, I replace the back term with r to the n plus 1 minus r to the n plus 2 all over 1 minus r. So now I can see that I've got a minus r to the n plus 1 plus r to the n plus 1 term on the top. So when they cancel out, what we can see is it simplifies to a lots of 1 minus r to the n plus 2 minus 1 minus r, which is exactly what I claimed it would be. That is the claimed statement for s n plus 1. So in other words, if the statement for Sn holds, then the statement for Sn plus 1 holds, and therefore the statement for Sn plus 2 holds, therefore the statement for Sn plus 3 holds. So because I knew it was true for the zeroth case, that implies it's true for the first, which implies it's true for the second, and I have established the truth of this um, statement for the partial sum of the geometric series by induction for all natural numbers. Another statement which I can establish by induction is that the sum of the first n positive odd numbers is n squared. So that's saying, well, the first uh, positive odd number is 1, the second positive odd number is 3, the third positive odd number 5, then 7, then 9. So they're all of this form, 2k minus 1, where k goes between 1 and n. And I'm saying that that sum will be n squared. So to prove by induction, I need to establish the first term. And that's quite straightforward, since if I set k equals 1 on the left to find the first odd number, well, I get 2 times 1 minus 1, which is 1. And if I'm adding one term of 1, I'll get the answer 1, which is equal to 1 squared. So trivially, it's true for n equals 1. Now I'm going to assume it's true for some other integer n, which is greater than or equal to 1. So in other words, if I want to add the sum of the first n plus 1 positive odd numbers, I'm adding the terms 2k minus 1, between k is 1, and not n now, but n plus 1. So that would be the sum of the terms of the first n terms, plus the next odd number. And the next odd number would be 2n plus 1. If I stopped counting at 2n minus 1 before, but I've got one more term, then I'm adding on 2n plus 1. So I previously assumed, as part of this inductive proof, that if I summed the first uh, n terms, I'd get n squared. So if, I, if that is true, then what I've got on the right-hand side now is n squared plus 2n plus 1, which you may recognise as n plus 1 all squared. So if it were true that the sum of 2k minus 1 to the first n terms gave me n squared, then it's definitely true that this sum up to the first n plus 1 terms will give me n plus 1 squared. So I've shown by induction, I've shown it's true for the first term, and I've also shown that if it's true for n, it's true for n plus 1, and hence by induction for all positive integers. I've also got this nice visual proof because I can see here that in fact if I look within each band then I've got um, the consecutive odd numbers. Starting on the bottom left I've got one grey square then adding to that three blue squares then adding to that five black squares then adding to that seven reds then uh, nine greys, 
then 11 blues. And you can see that what I'm getting, of course, at each stage is um, an ever larger square so far. So I can see that adding the first n positive odd numbers gives me n squared. We define the power set of a set A, which is phi of A, as the set containing all subsets of A, including the empty set and including A itself. For example, if I take the set A containing four elements, which I'll have the lowercase letters A, B, C and D. The power set for this, well, I've got the empty set, I could have, I could choose none of those elements. Or I could choose exactly one of them. So it could be the set containing just A, or the set containing just B, the set containing just C, or the set containing just D. Or I could pick any two of those. So I ha could have the sets AB, AC, AD, BC, BD, CD, or I could pick any three of those. Or I could pick every element of A and be left with A itself. So those are all of the possible subsets. Notice again that a set doesn't pay attention to order. So the set AB is the same as the set B and A. I'm now going to claim that the cardinality of the power set, the number of elements in the power set, so the number of possible distinct subsets of A, will be 2 to the power of the cardinality of A. That's the claim which we will try to improve by induction. I'm going to take B n to be a set containing n elements. So the cardinality of b n is n. And I want to show that that means that the cardinality of the power set of b n, so phi of b n, has cardinality of 2 to the power n. Well, it's super easy for b 0 that if B contains zero elements, there's only one possible subset of that, which is the empty set. If I've got no elements to choose from, I only have one choice of things to pick from that, which is picking nothing at all. So B zero has um, cardinality uh, zero, so its power set has cardinality 1, or 2 to the 0. So I now assume that it's true that b n for some integer n. So I now consider adding one distinct new element to b n. So I've now got a new set, which I'm going to call b n plus 1, which is b n union this new element Q. Q is definitely not in BN, um, so it's adding 1 to the cardinality of BN. Now, when I'm constructing the power set for BN union, the new element Q, well, I have two choices regarding Q. I either include Q in a subset or I don't. So if I don't include Q in a subset, then I've got all of the same subsets that I had for BN. Or if I do include Q in the subsets, I've got all of the subsets I had before with Q added to them. So if I had two to the N subsets of Bn, call those Sn1, Sn2, Sn3, up to Sn 
2 to the power n, and I'm assuming for this inductive proof there were 2 to the power n of those. Now adding one more of those, I've got the same 2 to the n, and I've also got each of those union q. So by having each of those without q and each of those with q, I've doubled the number of possible subsets. So I've um, increased the cardinality of the power set twofold. I've doubled it. So if I assumed that the cardinality of the power set of Bn was 2 to the n, then I've shown that the cardinality of the power set b n plus 1 has to be two lots of this 2 to the n, and two lots of 2 to the n is 2 to the n plus 1. So by induction, I showed it was true for n is 0, and I showed that if it's true for a general n, it's true for a general n plus 1. So I've established by induction that this is true for all natural numbers, n.